Well, thank you all for being here. My name is Lindsay. <laughs> My name is Jordan Howard. And we're here with you. Um, we want to share some information about a trip that we took. Uh, we were really lucky we had an opportunity to go to India. And so we're going to be kind of melding the Rise of Plastics presentation that you'll see a little bit, uh, that you've already seen and you'll see a little bit more of, with some new findings that we discovered in India. And we'll talk a little bit more about recycling and the impacts of that. But then we want to share with you why we're here. Okay, so I moved to Los Angeles about eight years ago uh, because I wanted to spend a lot of time in the ocean. I had grown up in the mountains in a little dome house in the middle of the forest, and I spent every summer coming to the beach, and it was always a really joyful and healing place for me. And so I took my last final on a Saturday, and I moved out to California that Saturday, and couldn't wait to spend a bunch of time at the beach. And not even after a year of living here, I was in the hospital in Santa Monica, and I had two doctors that were looking at me in the emergency room, and they were kind of mumbling to each other, and then they came over to me and they said, we have a series of, of some maybe strange questions for you. Have you been hanging out with the homeless population in a really like, intimate manner? And I was like, um, you know, I live in Venice Beach, but I wasn't in extra contact with them. And they asked me if I had been shooting up drugs. And I answered no. And then they asked me if I had been in prison recently. <laughs> which luckily I can also say no. Uh, and so then they walked away and they mumbled a little bit more and when they came back they said, the reason we've asked you those questions is because you have a very serious staph infection uh, that is resistant to antibiotics and so we're gonna have to operate and we, it was all a mystery to us of how I had, how I had gotten that infection and it turns out that I had gotten it by, by being in the ocean. Uh, so the same thing that had brought me a lot of joy and was very healing was making me sick, and that was the time that I knew I had to do something about it. Um, I don't want my kids to have to swim in the ocean in a hazmat suit. I don't have kids, but if and when I do. I want them to experience a blue ocean that's healing and fun as well. So I got involved with Surf Rider, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why I work on the plastics issue specifically later, but that's why I'm here. And my name is Jordan Howard, I'm 20 years old. I am a student at Santa Monica College. I'll be going to UCLA starting in January, studying political science. Um, and I got involved because I, I went to a green charter school. I am the product of a green school. And when I went to that green school, I went because it was a college prep school, not because I was interested in saving the world and I wanted to be an environmentalist. And I actually, I didn't care about the issues at all. I was very resistant to the green movement. And I found out my 10th grade year when I took a service learning class that I was only resistant to the green movement because I wasn't educated. And I saw that this environmental movement, this green movement, one of the problem, one of the biggest problems is that there isn't a lot of environmental education and people aren't being educated in the right way. I was I was only educated on the issues and I was not taught about, I wasn't told about the solutions. Nobody said that, hey, um, you can you, you can drive an electric car. I'm about to get an electric car, so that's what I said. <laughs> Nobody said, hey, you can drive an electric car and it won't pull and it won't pollute the atmosphere. You can um, have a reusable bag. It's not you're not bad because you shop and don't go to farmers markets and things. And so when I started learning about solutions, I was empowered and I wanted to talk about solutions with the people of my age. And when not when this happened, I was about 15 years old. So I've been on this journey for about five years met Lindsay my junior year of high school because I wanted to, I learned about the plastic plastic problem in our oceans and one of the ways that I was connected to it because I saw that there were solutions that we could implement right now. Unlike climate change, you're talking about, uh, talking about carbon taxes and, and uh, um, counting all the carbon in the atmosphere, plastic pollution, like we can stop that right now. We are the source and the source stops right here. We can all stop that with our friends, neighbors, uh, friend, friends, neighbors, classes, teachers, and I saw that, that we could do it, and I wanted to do it in my school. Met Lindsay, talk, we talked about what they were doing with Surf Rider, and we created Rise of Plastic Student Speaker Series. So I took the Rise of Plastics presentation that I had heard years ago, and I really wanted to share it with youth because they're not set in their ways, they're not resistant, and they talk a lot. So, and they're fun to work with. So we kind of melded these programs together, and since then, Jordan and the students that she's trained and students that are training each other now have reached more than 8,000 people with the Rise of Plastics presentation. 
and really it's empowering them to just be speakers and share solutions. And that's the reason that I work on the plastics issue is because as environmentalists, we can often be preachy or negative. And like she said, the solution is, is the most important part of it. And plastics is something that you can impact today. You don't have to have a bunch of resources or a bunch of people to make a change. It can only be individual action and collective action is great, but it's the positive solution and it's easy to impact. So. So now four years later, we've teamed up, we've worked together for about four years um, since we started in that small group, Rise Above Plastics group with about 30 students. And now we've spread to working with, so there's Rise Above Plastics, Surf Rider Foundation, Environmental Charter Schools, Five Gyres, Algalita Marine Research, and the Green Ambassadors. So we are in the middle of a plastic scene and we're all starring in it. I'm the director. <laughs> <laughs> and years ago, this is what the plastic scene looks like. We were totally excited to have something that made our lives easier. We didn't have to do dishes. We had more time to spend with our loved ones. And it came after World War One when we had all, or World War Two when we had all these machines that were making more machines. And we had to figure out how do we keep those machines going and keep jobs, keep jobs going. And plastics was what we came up with. What? Uh, yeah, we might need help. And, and one of the things that our grand, great great grandparents didn't realize when they were celebrating the creation of plastics was that all of the plastics that was in that Lifetime magazine in the 1950s is still here today, and plastic never goes away. So what's the real problem with plastics? Not all plastics are bad. Some of them get us to space. Some of them save lives. But we're talking about plastics that we come in contact with every day, that we use for a matter of minutes, or maybe even seconds. So let's talk about the resources that go into plastics. When you're giving this presentation, I can guarantee that you'll find somebody with a plastic water bottle on their desk. And if you pick that up and imagine it a third full with oil, that's how much oil it took to manufacture that bottle, fill it with water, and ship it to you. When you talk about water, especially in Southern California and water shortage, it took three times the amount of water in that bottle to ship and get that bottle to you. And when you talk about cost, the cost of the water in a plastic water bottle, which is usually the same as tap water, or a lot of times the same as tap water, except in the case when we take it from Fiji. Uh, it's about a thousand times more expensive than the water that we get out of the tap. So where does our plastic go? Where do you, do you guys know? Where does our plastic go? Yeah. Landfill, where is, but what's this away that we keep talking about? Ocean. So it goes out to the ocean, to the streets, to the landfill. So 50% of it goes into the landfill. 20% of it is made into durable goods, like uh, maybe a park bench. Uh, unaccounted for is about 25%. So that unaccounted for waste is headed straight to our oceans. Our unac that unaccounted for is headed straight to our oceans. A lot of people think that we have some type of brigade to prevent the plastic that's on our streets from going into the ocean, but it goes straight to the ocean. Every piece of trash that you see while you're walking down the street is going to the ocean if you don't pick it up. And what happens when it's in the ocean? This is Mae West. Have any of you seen this turtle? Yeah. So when Mae West was a little baby turtle, she swam into that plastic ring that you'll find on your Gatorade bottle or your milk bottle or your plastic water bottle. And she happened to be just the perfect size that the belt fit her perfectly. And it then she then grew around mm -hmm. the plastic, the, the plastic ring. So imagine putting a belt on when you're a very little baby and you still had it on today. You kind of constrict it. Uh, so since then, they've they found Mae West and they removed the plastic ring, but her body is pretty much still in that shape. And she can't be out in the wild because her protection, which is her shell, she can't duck into that. So plastic isn't just a problem in, at sea. We heard that you guys went to Sea Lab and you saw what happens with plastic and the camels. But when we went to India, we saw what's happening with plastic and the cows. Um, so the cow is a very sacred and holy animal in India. In fact, they look at it as the mother of all life. 
Uh, this was the largest landfill in the world, from what we understand. Uh, and there's a dairy farm down below it where they let the cows come and just feed on the extra food and trash that's in the landfill. And this is in Delhi. And we did see, as you saw before, there was there was a lot of cows just eating the food that's in the plastic bags on the street. And in Lucknow, India, uh, some city officials discovered that cows were dying at the rate of like 15 to 20,000 cows per month just in their small little town. And so they ordered an autopsy because they thought that some sort of crazy disease was taking all over their cows. And what they found when they opened the, the cows was there was about 50 to 60 plastic bags in every single cow. And since then, they've been studying all across India. And the woman that we met with when we were in India said that every cow that they've opened up, they found plastic bags in. So they have a lot of different organizations doing grassroots work, opening up the cows and giving like uh, literally plastic surgery, taking the cows' stomachs if they can fix them while they're still alive. So, we so do we really need this? And we talked about before with Sarah's presentation, you said, you know, but what about, what about recycling? So let's talk about recycling a little. When we went to India, we saw recycling on first firsthand because a lot of people think that that is, you know, it's a solution. So here's a graph showing our plastic generation. So how much plastic we've used. It starts at 1960 and it ends at 2005. So as you can see with the, the green line is our recovery. So the plastics that we're recycling. So if you, this graph is showing that we basically, we don't recycle as much as we recover at all. So you have heard the presentation, but can somebody tell me again, what percentage of plastics we recycle in the United States? Five to 10%. Five to 10%, and that's probably very generous. Uh, we, we can comfortably say five and know realistically it's probably a little bit less than that. So you can see that represented here. And like Sarah said, we're not actually recycling. Recycling would be taking aluminum and turning it into something alumini aluminum, taking a glass jar and turning it into another glass jar. But with plastics, you can't do that. When it's melted down, it actually gets downgraded and so we call it recovery. So it can't just be made into the same item. It gets made into things like carpet and benches. Chairs, some school chairs, jackets, scarves. So this is, so when we were in Mumbai, we went to Delhi, Mumbai, and Chennai. And we were in Mumbai, we went to a plastic recycling center. This is a community called Darabi, where one million people live in a place that's about two thirds the size of Manhattan, Central Park in Manhattan. So in less than one square mile, like she said, one million of Mumbai's 12 million people are living in this neighborhood. There's about 5,000 businesses next to single homes and about 15,000 single room factories all in this neighborhood. Durati is responsible, it's the powerhouse of Mumbai and, and of India as well. It's responsible for up to a billion annual uh, economic output. It's one of the largest slums in the world. So while we were walking, we had a full-on tour, about an hour and a half tour of the Ravi, and they were making chapati. This is women making bread, like a bread-like pastry. So this is mixed-use development at its, at its best, really. You see bakers, and upstairs from the bakers, there's men sewing furiously, making Levi knockoff jeans. Shirts. Uh, they were literally banging out paint cans to make them straight again and painting them over again. It's a form of recycling. But, but what we really want to talk about is the plastic recycling that went on. If you look on that picture, if you can see, there's plastic all over the roofs. Mm -hmm. So Dharavi, from what we understand, is responsible for recycling about 80% of Mumbai's plastics. And it's also neighborhoods like this that are responsible for recycling the plastics that we export uh, and send away. So when we talk about recycling and recovering, What's really happening, as Sarah mentioned, is we're collecting it and shipping it to another country like this. And people in this neighborhood where they're living and working are recycling and recovering our plastics. So this is a picture of one of the workers. So what they do, they literally, uh, they clean the plastics, they're sorting it. They make, the workers are making about $2 a day, uh, sorting the plastics, shaving it, 
shaving the plastic, sorting it, cleaning it again. They're in small factories. There's no ventilation in there. The rooms were about where Marty is with that camera um, and where Scott is. Very, really small rooms, no windows. It's about 105 degrees. We're all dripping in sweat as walking. We're just walking, listening to them talk. And these men are working. This is a different picture. We didn't see anyone with anything over their mouth. So they're inhaling all of those chemicals. So we're walking around in this neighborhood and not 10 minutes into it. I've got a splitting headache because there's so many fumes and toxins just kind of dancing around. And these guys are living in it every day. So these are plastics, uh, kind of a close-up a close of what you saw earlier, plastics waiting on their roofs, waiting to be recycled. So as Jordan mentioned, what they're doing is they're sorting through all these plastics. And one thing that was really surprising, you know, here we, we think if it's got a number, it's recycled, and we have this really easy system, one through six, so we know what's recyclable and what's not. And there, every little piece of plastic that holds value is being recycled. Pen caps, pen lids, bottle caps. And so this is them sorting it. And there's a very powerful quote in a book that I read called Beyond the Beautiful Forevers. And it, it, it's a look behind the scenes of slum life in India. And this man who's owned this recycling facility is passing the train on to his son. And he says, uh, and when they're talking about plastics recycling, he instructs him to, to understand if the plastic is going to be valuable or recyclable. Take a bite of it. Snap it open in your mouth, and if it tastes fresh and you can smell the chemical, then that's a good piece of plastic to recycle. It's going to be, it's going to be good. So this is this is what they're doing. And this is when they they make the flakes out of the plastic. So after they clean it, sort it, cut it, those are the flakes that come. Next slide, please. So and after they've. Uh, flaked it down into those colorful pieces, they rinse it right in the river and cool it down and then they melt it and then they shave it into these little flakes, literally like soak, soap flakes, and then they dry them out. And this is them drying the flakes on the top of a roof. Literally so. taking it all the way on the top of the roof and drying the flakes out. And if we were here in a factory, we wouldn't dry things, take it to the top of the roof to dry it, we would use, I dried my hair this morning. So after they've taken those flakes and rinsed them in the river again to cool them down, they melt it into these long plastic ropes, kind of like licorice, and then they put it in a slicer dicer machine and they make what we would refer to as nurdles. nurdles. And nurdles are what they ship out to people that are making these durable goods that are recovered. So they, so we use the plastic, I use the plastic bottle, I didn't use the plastic bottle this morning, but, so we use the plastic bottle, put it in a recycling bin, it goes down to Puente Hills, Puente Hills ships it to India or China, they shave through that plastic, clean it, sort it, recycle it, and then they ship it back to the US or the UK so that I could have a recycled scarf or so I can sit on a recycled um, plastic bench at the park. And while they're here, we should also mention that they are, so these men are, a lot of them go to um, Darabi to work and they're not there to live, their families aren't there. So then when they're making $2 a day, they don't want to find somewhere else to live. So most of them end up living where they're working. So still in taking all of those chemicals, working 14 to 16 hour days, recycling our plastics. And most of the men that we saw working didn't speak English or were too busy to work to working to speak with us. But the tour guide that was taking us around in this in this particular neighborhood shared with us that the owners of these facilities, who are not the people that are working, don't mind if these guys sleep there because it's free security for them. Uh, so they're not only working in it, but they're sleeping in these chemicals. And they said that most of them are pretty aware of the fact that they will probably lose about 20 years of their life due to the toxic nature of their work. So, do we really, do we need, really this need this? Do we really need this? we really need this system? So this is a picture of, that's me. Um, 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so that's me and Sunny from an organization called Swesha. It's a youth-led organization in New Delhi that's um, rallying people talking about the plastic solution and plastic pollution in India and getting youth to be the leaders of the solutions there. And we're actually on, we're sitting on one of the most polluted rivers in the world. It's called the Yamuna. It's also another uh, god in India. It provides them with a lot of things, um, and where if you behind us, it's our it's a plastic island that's ha that is uh, gathered inside of the river. So the river itself was super polluted. We were on this boat and they're rowing us through, and literally when his oar was coming up, it was just sludge just dripping from it. And when you look over. The high methane is literally causing the river to bubble. It's just bubbling away. And the, the river was literally, it was literally black. It looked like we were sitting on top of paint, jet black paint. It was like we knew going into this that we were going to one of the most polluted rivers in the world and we saw the pictures and it was going to be bad, but it was nothing that could prepare us for being on top of that disgusting river. So this is what we saw on the side of the river. Uh, the river itself is overwhelming, but this is the waste that's made its way to the river. And if you zoom in, you can see, what does that look like? Plastic what? What kind of plastic? Bags. 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 So why do you think that there's such a high concentration of plastic bags? Because they can't recycle? Because they can't be recycled. So, we were really shocked to find that the recycling rates in India are so high when we're recycling about 5 to maybe 10 percent. They're recycling about 60 percent of their plastics. Why do you think it's so high? Money. 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 Yeah. Money. yeah. Money. yeah. That's exactly right. So, more than 50 percent of the 1.1 billion people that are living in India live below the poverty line. That means they're making less than $1.25 per day. So the plastics are literally their income. So there's this is a family that we met. They live in the neighborhood right across from one of the schools that we were presenting at called the Vivekanan Kam. And we came home, we were in the afternoon, the sun was setting, and these guys were just getting home. You can see the little baby on the front that was helping them do their work. They spent the whole day traveling around their town, picking up these little plastics that they would tomorrow go sell to a junk dealer. And the junk dealer buys these plastics from them for very low rates. And then the junk dealer sells that to these facilities that we showed you earlier that are then recovering them. And, they, and they, they, they'll tell you that they don't bother picking up the plastic bags because the junk dealers won't accept the plastic bags because not only are they not worth anything, but the plastic bags are usually filled with something or they collect a lot of stuff on them. And if you were to put one of those in your bag, the junk dealer would think you're trying to just up the weight of the goods that you're turning in because that's how they get paid is by the weight of the plastics that they're turning in. And their job is called their rag pickers. So these guys are really heroes. There's not really such a concept of trash cans and recycle receptacles in India, but they've got a very effective system despite that. But the plastic bags are certainly being missed, and there's still 40% of things that just can't be recycled. So this is when we took our trip. We were in, um, in Mumbai. We went down to the mangroves, and as you can see, all of the different trash from the city has latched on to the mangroves. And it's mainly plastic mainly bags. Mainly plastic bags. And some of the people in India are fed up with it. This is a sign that we saw right next to the mangroves. And uh, I'll let you read it. Yourself. Yeah, you can read that. <laughs> so, do we really need these plastic yeah. bags? Oh, can you go back one? Yeah. That's good. this product. So it's clear to understand how plastics would be affecting the animals that are eating it and how it's affecting these people that are working with it every day, but it has a really big impact on us who are consuming goods that touch these plastic products every day. So how does it affect us? Uh, some researchers did a study recently and they took about 450 plastic items that come in contact with food, and they gathered them from everywhere from Walmart to Whole Foods. 
and they took those plastic items and tested them to see how much of them are leaching the chemicals that they're made of into those food products. And what they found was that about 70% of the plastics that they tested were leaching chemicals that act like estrogen into the food products that they were then consuming. But what's even more shocking is when they exposed those same 450 items to dishwashing, to general use, or to sunlight, 95% of them were leaching estrogen-like chemicals into the food. And these are the these are the organs that all uh, those plastic chemicals are disrupting. We, they all have different functions. Whether you're talking about the pancreas, the ovaries, the kidney, the heart, um, but and they are endocrine disruptors, and they're disrupting all of these different organs, whether it's your sexual functions or our tissues, our mood, our mood. So we know that. Plastics are not biodegrading and they're breaking down into little pieces in the sun or photodegrading, these tiny, teeny little pieces. And then when they're in the ocean, here's what's happening to them. The little pieces are collecting the toxins that don't attract to the water that's around it. So they're acting like little sponges and they've found that these little particles of plastic can have up to a million times the chemical concentration compared to the water around it. And then the fish are eating those toxic plastic pellets. This was a baby rainbow runner that five gyres, who you'll hear from later in the class, found when they were out at sea. And it had kind of been trailing along with them. They opened it up. It's maybe a couple of months old, or not even. It's been weeks old. And they found 14 or 15 pieces yeah. of plastic in the baby fish. So what's happening with that is these little fish are eating these little pieces of plastic which have these endocrine disruptors and toxins in them. And then the little fish are being eaten by the big fish. And then the big fish are being eaten by... Julie's zoning up. Nice. <laughs> by bigger fish. And by the time all of those toxins have built up in the fatty tissue and we eat them, they're super toxic. Do we really need this? And not only are we being affected by the chemicals that are in the plastic items that are touching our goods, but there's actually the same chemicals that relate to plastics that are in our goods. So the same chemicals that make plastics hard and soft can make our lotions really silky smooth and our nail polish really hard and our cologne last a really long time. So. This is a great resource, Environmental Working Group has a Skin Deep, which is an online resource and database where you can go look up any product and see what sort of toxic items are in it. Uh, a lot of girls and teenagers' face scrubs have these little plastic chemicals, those micro scrubs are actually tiny, teeny little pieces of plastic that we're just washing down into the sea. So we ask, do we really need this? Well, so now it's time to talk about the solutions. Like I mentioned before, my favorite part is the solutions because all this stuff is depressing. But we need to know the facts before we can get into the solutions. So now it's time for the, the fun part. Huh. And solutions come in many shapes and sizes. And as Sarah was saying, just get started and see what's sustainable for yourself. Start small and think on a bigger level. So individual action. You can, you know, you can bring your own bag to the grocery store, bring your own bag to the farmer's market, bring your own to-go ware. I saw Julie eating her salad with that wooden to-go ware. Bring your own canteen. And we also want to talk about how you don't have to go out and buy other things. You can use the, I use like my spaghetti jar or the jelly jar and you have a million jars in my kitchen. So you don't, you or know. take them to parties, better than that red solo cup thing. <laughs> Being plastic free doesn't mean you need to buy a whole new set of crap to be plastic free. Uh, just slow down, shop at the farmer's market, sit down and enjoy your coffee instead of taking it to go. It will bring other benefits as well. Uh, buying your food in bulk and cooking at home more, taking your jar, having them weigh it before, it's kind of a pain and you'll have some really interesting conversations with the people who don't want to weigh your jars. And it's all a learning opportunity. Every interaction that you've got with people that don't understand why you don't want a straw or don't understand why you don't want a bag, if you do it in a positive way and open it 
up for dialogue, then it's one more person that you're touching and leaving that message with. Like Sarah did earlier when she was telling her story about the man at the beach. You know, it was another. There's another way that she that she could have said it. She could have told the guy he didn't want to pollute the ocean and why was he being an idiot. And, but she inspired him. So now next time he's gonna rethink. Hopefully you didn't say that, Sarah. And that was a true story. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're ready to take it to the next level, collective action is very powerful. These are uh, youth in India that have gathered to really protest. This is our sacred river, and we're dumping our stuff in it, and we, this needs to come to an end. And so we walked up and down the river in this very holy city, and there was groups that had set themselves up all along the river, and they were all there for the same purpose and cause. And this is a school in Santa, Santa Barbara High School. You can go to the next slide as well. This is in Santa Barbara High School. They installed these drinking stations. So encouraging people to bring their stainless steel bottles and they have the drinking stations available. And this actually calculates how many plastic bottles they're eliminating. And that, that's cool because you know people like to see numbers. That looks like a big number. And you act like you're a part of something bigger. Let's bring back the fountain. I think there's an iPhone app that you can search for. What is it? We tap. So another concept is voting with your dollar. And this is an example of, it's actually, Carrot Mob is a website where you can log on and find people that have come together and gone to the vendors that they frequent and asked them. So this is an example of some students in Thailand. They went to their local grocery store and they said, if we bring at least 500 students to shop at your market on February 20th, will you stop handing out single-use bags? And he said, okay, fine. And they ended up getting 1,300 people to come and buy something on that day. The owner upped his sales by $19,000 on that day and they successfully stopped handing out plastic bags. So this is a, you know, a really important concept. You're, you're a customer and vote with your dollar and, and let your your wishes be heard. And this is an example of just a, um, a market in India. Well, not a market. You can see it's a stand, a juice stand in India. Um, and just encouraging as well, letting the producers know what the consumers want. One of the and having that conversation with the and having that conversation with the guy on the street saying, "Hey, hey, do you you should use glass cups? What if you use glass cups and wash them?" Giving them ideas instead of just talking about the problem. One of the students we worked with in India wanted. To, he was walking around his neighborhood and noticing all these plastic chai cups and plastic juice cups. And so he went to the vendor, and the vendor wanted nothing to do with him, really, when he was asking him to stop handing out plastic cups. And so he got discouraged, and he went back the next day and said, can I just take you on a walk? And he took the vendor on a walk, and he showed them all the plastic that was hanging around the neighborhood. And he said, you and I live here, and let's not do this. And so the vendor listened to him and said, but what do I do? And so the little boy walked around the neighborhood and asked his neighbors to donate these glass jars. You can see they're a bunch of different sizes and shapes. And they donated them to the stand. And so the stand said, okay, fine. We won't hand out the plastic anymore. Policy. So it, for the last, um, like the last like two months, there's been a lot of youth-driven um, youth driven action in the terms of plastic pollution. Uh, this was one of the schools in one of the schools in LAUSD's district. The students created an art sculpture and they collected all the styrofoam platters from lunch because they wanted to show that's my middle school. Nice, oh, okay. nice. And they wanted to show they wanted to show the, the superintendent this is how much plastic that we use. This is how much money we could save. So they created this art sculpture, took pictures a few months later, superintendent in the second largest school district in the United States said, let's not use any more styrofoam. And this is another example of a girl who was, I think she's 13 or 13. something. Yeah, and she collected a bunch of signatures saying, please be in plastic bags and pass this. And she got invited to sit down at dinner with her governor and, and he listened to what she was saying. And they were successful in passing that. And so this is, the reason we're sharing with you all these youth examples is because as we're trying to pass policy that works, we've seen city council hearings where everybody's saying the same thing or they're saying very intelligent things, but nobody's really listening. It's in one and out the other because we've got a bunch of business to do. And the second youth stand up and say something representing the future generations and they're a little bit poetic or just a little bit passionate, 
Everyone on city council pays attention. They're super effective at delivering the message and being heard. They start taking out their phones, taking pictures. They start listening. Not that they won't listen to you, but you should have youth join you. That's what we're saying. But really, being in India was a, a really big. Jordan and I had moments where we asked ourselves, what are we doing in the United States? It feels like such a joke that we are upset that a couple of pieces of trash are on our beach and that somebody's not recycling instead of recycling. You go to India and it's just so overwhelming and everywhere. And so really what we landed on is that we are gonna have to design our, our way out of it. We can't change everybody's behavior, especially people that are requiring this for their, for their sustenance and for their livelihood. So we've got to design a smarter way of living. So this organization at the top is uh, Hug It Forward. They're in Guatemala making, um, making schools out of plastic bottles. So they tell the communities, so um, right before Hug It Forward gets ready to build the school, they tell the communities to collect your trash, put it inside the plastic bottles. They stuff all the trash inside the home, the trash from the home, inside the plastic bottles, making it really, really, really tight. And they use the plastic bottles for the foundation for the schools. And they uh, built like eight schools in Guatemala where there aren't schools before. So the plastic isn't necessarily the solution. Well, it's the solution for another problem that they're having. They didn't have a school before and now they have this plastic problem. Because the bottles will be here forever, whether we like it or not. So let's use something. Let's make something useful out of it. And that's a really good example of a leader and somebody that's setting example but maybe not replicable. So the real solution is extended producer responsibility. How many of you have gotten a teeny tiny memory chip and opened about a mile of plastic packaging around it? Yeah, silly. So what we really need to do and what's been effective in countries like Germany is requiring that manufacturers are responsible for what they're putting out there. And it's been done successfully in Germany. In Germany, of course, it was the people that came together and they started leaving the plastic trash at the Target or the Walmart or whatever saying, we don't want to take this home. And finally, Walmart got so much of it that they called the manufacturer and said, you've got to start manufacturing this different because we're having to dispose of all of your trash. And I don't know if that's necessarily going to work here, but it talking is. to policymakers about yes, talking to policymakers about making companies responsible for what they're putting out there. And we use Apple as a good example of people that are really taking their products back, trying to put them back into the system and reducing their plastic packaging. Not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, it may not be perfect now, but if you've noticed in the last five years, the amount of um, packaging that they've used has definitely changed. Education, most important one of all. The reason why we're all here, the reason why you guys are all here. So it's now you know all of the, the issues, the facts, the solutions. Now it's your turn to get out there and educate someone else. So it, it's gonna start with all of you. Come together as a team. Get your team from the outside of this room, inside of this room, but get, develop your team. I cannot see what that says at all. Share what you learn. Share what you learn with someone outside of here. Share with your daughter, your sister, your cousin, your neighbor, the guy behind you that's um, about to use 50 plastic bags. Share with your social networks, Facebook, Twitter, your friends, your family, businesses. And then they're going to share with their social networks, their friends and family. And then it's gonna, our policymakers are gonna start hearing about it. And remember, it all started with you, right in the middle. You can just keep going to the end. Um, one reminder is just keep it fun. We, we always like to keep our solutions fun. That's our contact information. Tweet me on Twitter.